I'm back. Hey guys, it's Kate and welcome back to my channel. It has literally been two years since I've posted a video. So number one, I wanna say I'm so sorry for being MIA. Number two, not gonna make excuses, but I do wanna offer some explanation. Basically, I just got busy with life, with work, with school, and I started making excuses for myself and for my lack of posting. So I wanna apologize for that and say that videos are coming back, specifically Girl Talk. I have missed making Girl Talk so much. I have missed having spiritual conversations with you guys and connecting with you on more personal levels. So I'm so excited to introduce today's episode, which is with my very best friend in the world, Allison Romero. We have been talking about filming this video since I think like 2021, which is crazy. But we are super excited to bring you this video today. In this video, we cover so many different topics. This is definitely going to be a longer video. So definitely prepare yourself before you watch it. Get a snack, get some coffee. If you're gonna go do something, maybe just stick your AirPods in and listen to this in sort of a podcast format. But today's episode is going to cover so many different topics. We talk about dating, social media, mental health, friendship, and so many other things. I have been so excited to film this video for a very long time, and I just wanted the timing to be perfect for her and for both of us, and just wanted to make sure that we really took our time filming this and discussing it, talking about it ahead of time, making sure that it was right. And so I'm really, really excited that my first video back is with my best friend because she really is like the closest person to me. And I am just so excited for you guys to see this video. And I really hope that it speaks to you. Allison has one of the greatest testimonies I think I've ever heard. And I just am very excited to share this with you guys and to get your guys' feedback. And I'm so excited to be back. And I just, I can't wait for this series to kind of restart and just to kind of get reacquainted with you guys. How have you been? How's everybody doing? I'm so excited. So anyways, without further ado, we are going to get into the video. I'm just so excited. And I really hope that you guys receive this and that you kind of can take something from this video and maybe apply it to your life or maybe this will help you to understand something in a deeper level. But whatever you take from this video, I just really hope that it speaks to you, it speaks to your heart, and I hope that you know that a lot of prayer and preparation went into this video, and we're very, very excited to bring it to you, and we hope that you guys enjoy it so much, and I love you guys so much! So excited to be back! Without further ado, Let's get into it. Welcome back to another episode of Girl Talk. I am so excited about today's guest. When I initially thought about this series, my intention was really to bring women that inspired me on to talk to young girls and to just talk about their testimonies and just give inspiration to the younger generation. And I think one of the biggest like inspirations in my life, one of the most special people to me is my very best friend in the world, Allison Romero. And it still sounds weird coming out because <laughs> I'm so used to calling you Allison Bell Saber at all times when referring to you. Um, <laughs> but I'm so excited to have my best friend, Allison, and we have been friends for 15 years now, but really gotten closer, you know, as we've gotten older, but I, I really always say that she is my person. She's my soulmate friend, my ride or die bestie. And, um, that person that everybody brings up when they say, I wish I had an Allison in my life. I'm super excited for today's episode. We are going to be covering a lot of different topics. And this is an episode that we have been talking about since I think 2021, so it's a long time in the making, and I'm super excited about it. So without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce my best friend, Allison, 
And uh, thank you for joining us today. Hello, everybody. I first want to say I am definitely honored that Kate asked me to be in her Girl Talk video when she asked me like a year and a half ago. I was like, what? <laughs> um, so I definitely take it as an honor and a privilege um, to come on here and kind of share who I am and my testimony and everything like that. So starting off right now, I live out in Arizona. Uh, my husband and I are youth pastoring at a church out here in Peoria in this beautiful 115 degree weather in the summer. So it's our first summer here. So we're just trying to survive. And Isaiah likes to say, <laughs> sorry, Isaiah likes to say that God made Arizona so that people wouldn't want to go to hell because it's literally <laughs> so hot. Out here, I work as a trauma support specialist with children who've gone through like something super traumatic. I have my degree in psychology, so I love all things psychology, understanding people and um, why they're the way that they are and like all of that kind of stuff. And before coming out here, I worked as a mental health tech at a psychiatric hospital on a unit of primarily people who came right from the hospital from trying to commit suicide. So I dealt with a lot of um, people who faced severe depression, anxiety, all sorts of stuff. Honestly, we saw everything there. Um, but that's really like my heart and my burden is for people who are struggling and at their lowest point in life. So I really got into psychology because I just get such a thrill in understanding like why someone is the way that they are, why their personality is the way that it is and things of that nature and just truly understanding the why of, of people. And I think that's why I'm also ended up in ministry is because you're dealing with people and you have to be able to understand why people are the way that they are in order to know how to properly approach them in certain situations and things of that nature. I'm newly married I've been married a year um and and we are now in ministry so it's been it's been a journey I think that Allison has one of the best testimonies that I've really ever heard and I've been in church my whole life been a PK for a majority of my life and so I've heard a lot of a lot of stories about things that people have gone through and I've I've heard you know a lot of times just the dark side of that and how when people go through things, sometimes they allow those things to take over and they just leave the church and they never come back and they kind of blame the church or they blame people for things that they've been through. But the main reason that I really thought that Allison would be a great person to have on Girl Talk is because every time she shares this testimony with not only me, but with other girls, I can just see that it's giving them hope and it's helping them to maybe feel less alone in the things that they're going through. So I think it's really important to share testimonies. And the Bible also talks about that we overcome by the word of our testimony. So I think sometimes when people have gone through a lot of things, they feel like maybe they need to keep those things of themselves or not really tell people because, you know, they don't want people to see them differently or, or they don't want people to assume and so we might not go into complete detail, but um, I do think it's important that Allison shares some of her story with you guys because it's it's really special and um, it's very inspiring. So if you want to maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I could definitely go in several different directions um, in regarding my testimony just because God has done so many things um, specifically in the last three years of my life. Um, so beginning at 2020, I just found myself in a very like dark place mentally um, with a lot of confusion and just knowing that I needed to get out of a situation that I was in. And it came to a point where I, I just asked God, like, God, would you just expose this for me? If this is going on behind the scenes, can you just show it to me? Um, because I didn't have the strength to, to like walk away from something I, I really knew was going on, but I just needed to see clear as day direction from God that I needed to walk away. And, and that day that I prayed that, um, God revealed it to me right away, like within hours of that, 
um, he exposed so much. And like in that moment, I knew that my whole life was about to fall apart. Um, the life that I knew and thought would be my future. And, um, in that moment of like realization about what was about to happen, even though I knew it was going to be the hardest thing I've ever dealt with in my entire life. The only words I could say is like, thank you, Jesus. Cause even though I knew everything was about to fall apart, I knew he was saving me from long-term and like, I don't even know how to put it to words, other emotions I was feeling in that because I really felt, for a while before that, very emotionally numb. After that, I, I really fell into severe, severe anxiety. And I dealt with every single day, just growing up constantly. Like I, my mind constantly replayed what was happening. And I was at a very dark place mentally. I, I almost developed an eating disorder. I was so tiny. Like I lost like 20 pounds and I really don't have 20 pounds to lose. Um, and so I was just tortured in my mind, like 24 seven. And my only escape of reality was honestly going to sleep. And then I would be tortured in my dreams and just constantly just replaying everything I was going through. And honestly, like I can't even put to words, um, the emotion and the depth of the hurt, um, and betrayal, that I was feeling. There was a point in time where I just, I just couldn't leave my bed. I didn't even go to church and my parents, like my whole family, I remember I was watching church live and like they all gathered and got prayed for. And I was like, I'm pretty sure they're getting prayed for it for me because I couldn't even get myself to get up and get ready for church. I was so mentally sick to the point where like, I remember calling my 12 year old sister and just asking her like, can you just bring me down a small snack? Like I'm literally so physically weak. I, I can't even sit up without getting like super sick. Like I couldn't even make it to the bathroom. So I'm like, I just need something in my system to like help me like make it a few feet to the bathroom. Like I was so, so sick um, mentally after facing this because what I had known to be my life for five plus years changed in an instant. And so it was just a lot mentally to take in. And um, in those moments, like I really couldn't see how this could get better. And, and in those moments is when I'm being, I was being like constantly tortured mentally. Um, you start to think of like thoughts of suicide, which I've never been had depression in my life up until that moment where I'm like, Oh my gosh, like I just can't see how there would be light at the end of the tunnel, which obviously was so false. But in that moment, that's kind of how you think you can't really see because you're just being tortured. Fast forward to a few months later, I was studying and I'm really into psychology. So I was reading about some psychologist, I don't even remember what the name is right now, but um, I randomly felt like I didn't even think I believed in God anymore. And like, I got to that low of a point where I instantly caught myself when I even thought that. And I was like, no, this isn't true. Like, I know God has answered my prayers. There's been so many times where I would pray something and it would be answered like that. And like, that doesn't happen to everyone. So like, I knew like, no, I know that was of God. And so I was kind of at like a rock and a hard place. Like, okay, so I either like walk away from I've known all my life or I give it one more chance. And um, I kind of discussed earlier with Kate, like I was almost like an apostolic hater at one point because I got to a point where like, I was hurt so much, not necessarily from the church, but I just was like starting to question everything because people can relate. Once you've been manipulated in some form, you start to think that like you're always being manipulated. Like you start mm -hmm. to view people from that lens of like, there's a possibility they're like manipulating me completely because it messes with your mind. Mm -hmm. And so I got to a point where even like my whole life that I've lived in church, I was like, no, I don't think none of this is real. And so I started just questioning everything. And like, I just became like one of those people. And we all know people like that who, who've been hurt in some way. So they just go like crazy against everything that they've ever believed in. 
And that's kind of who I was. In February of 2020, we had a evangelist come to our church and he came up to me as I was praying. And he was one of those like evangelists that like God would speak to him, like they're going through this and this and this. And like, he was always spot on. So I was always scared of him, like kind of like hiding in the background. So I was genuinely all week of revival. I was like hiding from him because I didn't want him to come up to me and be like, you have to get out of that situation. Literally, I didn't even want to hear it. Even if it was from God, I didn't want to hear it. The last day of revival, he came up to me. And when I tell you, I probably jumped like two feet backwards because I was so scared. (laughs) And I was like, oh no, like I thought I avoided him all week in the very last day of revival. Like he came up to me and he's like, you're about to go through a trial. And you're going to have to choose whether you're going to live for God or you're not. And I was like, okay. Like, I didn't really think much of it. I was just like, okay, whatever. Um, like I was sometimes very like back and forth, but I didn't really think anything of it. And honestly, I completely forgot that happened until like a year later when I was looking back at everything that God had clearly aligned. So two weeks after that is when my life just fell apart. Like I previously mentioned, and I just knew everything was about to change. And so when I got to a place of like, I don't even think I believe in God anymore. I instantly remembered what, what that evangelist had spoken into me and that I'm going to come to a place where I'm going to have to decide whether I live for God or I don't. So I decided like, okay, I'll, I'm going to hold on to this one and give it one more chance. Um, or else like I'm leaving, like I'm done. And, um, The next day, literally the next day, I got a text from my friend, Chris Honeycutt, and he randomly was like, have you ever considered going to CLC, which is Christian Life College in Stockton, California? And I was like, do I look like someone that would go to Bible college? Like what (laughs) was pretty evident at that point in my life that like, I just wasn't someone that would go to Bible college. Um, I don't know how else to explain it. I just didn't look the part. I, I was like confused why he would even think that I would go. And I was like, no, why did you ask like a bunch of people or something? And he's like, he's like, no, I only asked you. And I'm like, why? And he's like, God. And I was like, huh. And then he called me and he's like, if you have any doubts about what you believe, um, you need to come to CLC. Like God's going to change that. Mm. And I was like, wow, that's so crazy that he would just say that to me after like I've been struggling with these thoughts and like of course I didn't tell him that and then the following Sunday I had another evangelist at the church and they were like somebody in here has been researching other doctrines mind you my church is like probably 200 people in Michigan and so he's like somebody in here has been like researching other doctrines and I want to let you know like this isn't emotionalism like this is this is truth And he's like, and I know who it is. Okay. That Sunday, I looked completely the part, like there'd be no distinction of like, oh, that girl must be struggling. So I'm going to say this to her. No, you would have never known. So he's like, everyone come to the altar. And I'm like shaking because I'm like, my gosh, like I had, I had been researching so many other things. So I get to the altar and I'm like doing one of these. And all of a (laughs) sudden right here, he's like, I know it's you. Like the Lord's, yeah, the Holy Ghost spoke to me that it was you. And he's like, this is truth. Like, and so anyways, it was like, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, it's like God kept using random people to like speak to me. And I was like, well, clearly he's trying to get my attention, you know? And then like the following Sunday, it was about like parents, like trying to convince parents, like to let your kids go off and do things. Cause my parents didn't want me to move across the country and go to CLC. Anyways, all this stuff was going on. There's so many more details I could go into, but we'd literally be here all day if I did that. So um, long story short, there was so many closed doors because there was just so many reasons I couldn't go. Um, So my parents literally said like, it'll be like a miracle if you can actually, if all these doors open, then you can go. And so I had gotten myself in a situation because I had tried to like fight a spiritual battle physically. That's what my dad told, tells me. He says, I tried to fight a spiritual battle physically. So I got myself into a bit of a situation that was not allowing me to go out of state or anything like that. And so um, there was, when I tell you, there was so many reasons I couldn't go, like 
genuinely so many closed doors. But then one by one, like these doors just started flinging open for me to be able to go. And I was like, oh my gosh, like maybe I am supposed to go here and like get away and all sorts of stuff. And I kind of looked at it as like a spiritual boot camp. I was like, well, I'll give it one last chance. Like I'll go, go see if this is what I believe. And like, I'm going to just go for a semester. Like, you know, this all happened. And then I had to like go to school within two weeks. So I didn't even like tell anybody. I had to tell everyone like last minute that I was like packing up my stuff and moving across the country. And all of my friends knew, like, I just didn't really believe any of this anymore. And I was just not in a good place mentally or spiritually. Like, people knew that. So to randomly be like, oh, by the way, hey, I'm going to Bible college. They're going to be like, you? What are you talking about? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And that's probably a lot of the reactions that I got. <laughs> because <laughs> I tell them, like, a week before going, like, hey, like, I showed up at my church, like, Hey, I'm going to Bible college and everyone's all confused. Like what? And so anyways, I had to like pack up all my stuff and I didn't have any of the like proper clothing to wear at a Bible college. So I had to literally take like so many (laughs) skirts and dresses from like a friend of mine who was like off in the military. So she didn't use her clothes. And so I literally got to like go over to her house and like take everything out of her closet because nothing I had anymore was like you have to hold yourself to a higher standard when you're going to this like school and stuff and dress super modestly. So I didn't, truthfully, I didn't have that stuff anymore. And, um, so anyways, as I was packing my clothes, there was just so many things I could get into, but I was like trying to pack my suitcase and not even like a quarter of my clothes would fit. And I'm like, there's no way I can move all my stuff with like barely any outfits like because I had to fly there because I'm from Michigan so California is not a few states away and so um anyways as I was packing like none of this would work and I remembered um sister Walker being at a ladies conference and her saying something about like one time her suitcase she couldn't get it to fit and so she was like praying about it and like God or whatever like told her like how to zip up her suitcase a certain way and then it like all fit like it sounds crazy but if you were there you'd be like whoa and so like I instantly remembered us like that type of story and so I like felt like this was silly to pray but I'm like God if you want me to start dressing more modestly then you're gonna have to help me fit my stuff in my suitcase like instantly not kidding like I felt like God told me like throw everything you have into a garbage bag and then put it in the suitcase and zip it up I was like okay and so I threw everything into the the garbage bag like and I put in my suitcase and it it literally started zipping so I was like no way and it literally zipped up completely and I was like this is insane So like to other people, you might look at that and laugh, but like, that means a lot to me because this Mm -hmm. was something personal to me that I had been struggling with. (laughs) It's funny because my mom was knew I had trouble like packing. So she bought me like those plastic things that like suck the air out and like makes so much room in your suitcase. And so she showed me like, oh, I got these. And I'm like, no, don't touch my suitcase. Like, trust me. Like everything's packed in there. I was like, it was a God moment. Like, just trust me. Don't do it. And she's like, she went behind my back and undid my suitcase, took all my clothes out, tried to put them like vacuumed out the air, went to put them back and not even a quarter of them would fit. Mm. And so then I told her like, Oh my gosh, like, why did you do that? I told you not to touch it. Like, I'm telling you that was a God moment. Mm-hmm. And you know, people don't believe you because that's silly to them. So then we tried it again with like the, the um, garbage bag. And it wouldn't work. And my mom's like, oh, you must be adding more clothes now. I'm like, no, you tried to override what God did, basically. <laughs> and so, like, of course, like my mom was just trying to help. But I'm just saying, like, it didn't work that time. So my mom ended up having to ship out like a huge box of half my clothes because it wouldn't fit in the suitcase anymore. And so, like, I promise you, like, that was a God thing, like, personally for me. And um, anyway, so when I made it to CLC... Um, I was really struggling at that point with like feeling like I'll never be myself again. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to like, once they've gone through like a deep hurt, um, 
you like lose your personality in a sense, like, because you're no longer this like carefree, like innocent, ignorant person. Like now you've been hurt and like damaged in some way. So like it, it almost like steals your joy. Yeah. And so like, I was like, I felt a lot of anger towards people, like specifically men. I was like really struggling. Like I was more aggressive and irritable when really like that was never my personality growing up. I was very bubbly, goofy, fun. And like all of a sudden I was just this like angry, irritable girl who was like aggressive and it just wasn't me. And I really struggled with that because I'm just like, wow, I'll never be who I was. I'll never be myself again. And that really hit me hard because I felt like somebody had robbed me of myself and because through her and stuff. And um, I didn't tell anybody that I was struggling with this or anything like that, but I went to chapel one day and I was just kind of sitting there super discouraged. I had my head down. I was praying, but I was just feeling really discouraged. And somebody came over to me and it was the last person you ever expect to pray over me. And she came over to me and she started, mind you, she didn't know any of this going on. She was like, don't believe the lies of the devil that you'll never be who you were before you were hurt. She's like, I don't know what you've been through, but I see myself in you. And I know it was a similar situation. Side note, she has a very similar testimony to me. And I didn't find that out till months later, but she has a very Mm -hmm. almost like mirrored testimony um, to me. And so anyways, back to what she was saying. And she's like, God's going to heal you as if you never went through that hurt. And, um, and I was like shocked and I was just sobbing, like weeping. I couldn't even get words out because I didn't even think that that was possible. I never thought about the fact that God could heal you as if you'd never went through that. He heals physical miracles all the time. He, he heals people of cancer, diseases, all sorts of stuff. But I never considered the fact that he could physically heal my brain as if I never felt that type of hurt. And, um, so I was just like weeping and she prayed over me like that in that moment, like I was going to be like refreshed completely, like as if I never had had been through that hurt. And previous to that, like even the thought of what I had gone through, I was like instantly sick, instantly anxious, like to the point of like throwing up um, mm-hmm. even the thought, even the thought of it, like I had to distract myself from even thinking about it or else I would get physically sick. And after that, I could think back to it with no emotion. And even now it's like, I can look back at things that I have been through. And instead of feeling that anxiousness and like just pain and sickness, I'm like, I have an even greater love for God and reverence for him for what he brought me out of. So it's Mm -hmm. crazy how much you can turn like your lowest, darkest, horrible moments that you have trouble even thinking about. God can turn it around to where like when you think about it, it's such an amazing feeling of like gratefulness and like, oh my gosh, like such a reverence and a love for God because you're like, wow, like look at what he did. Look at what he brought me out of. And so that's, that is crazy to me that what I once thought back to and was sick about, I can think back to and have an even greater love for God because everything we go through is always for his glory. Moving forward after I was healed with all that, I still like didn't have an interest in men. <laughs> like I was like, I, I'm here for myself. I'm focusing on myself. Like I was loving my single era of just being myself. And, um, but obviously I ended up meeting my husband um, there and I thought he was super cute. But again, I just wasn't interested. Um, and then after we left CLC, all these things started happening, which was like signs of like, almost like confirmation that he was the one God kept showing me in so many different ways. Like this is your person. And like with Isaiah, I felt so much peace. Um, Mm -hmm. that somebody has said, I don't remember who they're like, if it comes with questions and confusion, it's not of God, because if it's of God, it comes with peace and confirmation. And like, that's exactly what I felt when I met Isaiah and, um, come to find out after I left the reason that my friend Chris Honeycutt had even texted me and told me to come to CLC was because he was with Isaiah at the time. And they got on the topic of me. Isaiah didn't even know who I was, but 
Chris had mentioned something that I had been going through, um, part of my story. And he was like, Isaiah's like, well, you need to tell her to come to CLC and it'll change her life. It was like as simple as that. And that's when Chris texted me. And um, it's just interesting to me that it all circled back to Isaiah. Like to me, that's just like even more confirmation that like that was my husband. And yeah. um, we had like, little coincidences, like um, our siblings being the exact same age. We had a little brother and sister that were both 13 and 11 at the time, or both of our dads had the same birthday and our little brothers had the same birthday. And like, there was a lot of birthdays in the families that were like the exact same day. Like, I get that like people have similar birthdays all the time, but it's like, what, what are the odds that our dads are going to have the same birthday? Our brothers are going to have the same birthday. There was like another person in the mm-hmm. family birthday too. And so yeah. it was just, like so many like random things like that. Or um, when we were praying about Isaiah moving to Michigan, his mom had taken like a video of them when they were like at the grand Canyon or something like that. And like, literally there was just a little flag in the middle of the video, only flag there that said Michigan. And so she was like, no way, because at this point, so many coincidences were happening that we were all kind of like, there's just no way. Yeah. And um, we'll get into this more a little bit later, but Kate and I had writ- wrote like out lists of like qualities for that we wanted in a future husband. And we prayed over the list and stuff. And so like, I got my list back out because I was like, wait a second. And Isaiah checked off literally every single thing on my list. So I was like, what oh my gosh this is my this is my future husband like I like freaked out honestly I felt like it was right before I ever felt the emotions of loving him which I feel like most people don't like go through that but for me I literally was like oh my gosh I'm pretty sure this is my husband (laughs) before I ever felt it personally and um it was just like a crazy feeling because it just felt like peaceful and like both of our families were like completely on board and anyways it's just like crazy how it happened and so we ended up dating we met in September of 2021 we started dating in December of 2021 and we got married in May of 2022 so we literally dated and got married within five months so to <laughs> everyone, that sounds like you're literally a lunatic like you're insane but like for us, it just felt like it didn't feel like it happened like that. It didn't feel like that at all. It felt like we've always known each other. It felt like we were always each other's persons. And like, it's just like when it's from God, like that's how it's going to feel. It's going to feel right. You're not going to be confused. And like, it's just going to, you're going to know. And, um, but that doesn't mean like Isaiah was some perfect human. Like, no, of course not. We're, we're all human, Uh, but he's perfect for me. Circling back to, everything now months later um we got offered to move to Arizona and youth pastor at an amazing church out here and I was like no I don't I'm not doing that like I'm staying with my family like I was being kind of selfish because I I have a great family and I wanted to be with them so we originally told them no and then they were like no come out here and like visit the church um and all that and just see how you feel. And so we're like, okay, yeah, we'll still come out there and preach and whatever. We get out there. And so we met with the previous youth pastor and he was kind of like going over some of the things that he has dealt with and what we might face if we decide to come. And he was discussing a situation with a young girl. And literally the, the situation that he explained was something that I had also gone through as a young girl. And I was like, I was shocked because I was like, this is my why. Like, this is why I'm here and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, I went through all of this for this moment. And like, Mm -hmm. it was like a realization moment of like, no, this is where we're supposed to be. What I didn't know at the time is that my husband had been praying like, God, if this is where you want us to be, you're going to have to change my wife's mind because she doesn't want to come out here. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I went back to the hotel and I was like telling my husband, like, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure this is where we're supposed to be. And he's like, he told me like, I didn't tell you this, but I've been praying. Like, if this is where we're supposed to be, like change my wife's mind. And so like everything just like kind of like fell into place. And 
And we were like, yeah, this is, which is a very hard decision for me. I'm very close to my friends and family in Michigan. Like this wasn't just some random decision. Like this is, this is something, this was a huge decision. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, so now we're here, we're youth pastoring and literally so much has happened in the last two and a half years that every time I think about it, I get choked up because it's like, how did God turn this into this? Like it's more than more than I could ever even fathom or like comprehend in that moment, in those moments of like darkness and like my lowest moments, I would have never in a million years thought that I'd be married um, just two short years later to some random dude um, <laughs> that I hadn't even met yet and mm -hmm. that I would be in ministry. It doesn't matter who you are. He can turn around your situation like that. And I feel like that's what's like shocks everybody. And they're so like thankful for in my own life is like, I think it like shocks people because it's like they saw how fast everything was turned around once I finally gave it to God and just was like, I'm done doing this on my own. Like, this is horrible. Like trying to figure things out on your own will literally drive you to insanity. And I realized that because... I realized like I was playing God in my own life and you cannot play God. Like mm. you can, try, but it'll drain you dry. Like literally yeah. it's too heavy of a burden for you to carry. And like, oftentimes like we really carry burdens that we were never meant to carry. They're not ours to carry. You have to mm -hmm. give it to. Them. So for years I did that. And once I finally like surrendered it to God, he changed the course of my life so fast. And so it's just incredible how we ended up here and I could talk about it all day. And there's so many more details of like my testimony and like, I'd love to share it more privately, but it's just been, it's been amazing. And I feel like I still am like comprehending it every day. Like some days I wake up and I'm like, Oh my gosh, how am I leading all these young girls? It's just crazy, um, but I'm super thankful for it. Well, I feel like there's literally so much to unpack um, because I didn't want to interrupt you, but there were there were things that I wanted to add. Um, I think it's important to note that Allison and myself are probably two of the most hard-headed people um, when it comes to like what we want to do. And a lot of times, like, we need signs to, like, literally smack us in the face to be like, stop doing that or do this instead or whatever. And so a lot of times we've both had to learn the really hard way because we decide to do things the way we want to do it. And then we're like, yeah, that did not work. So, all right, God, I'm actually going to give it to you for real this time because every time I try to do it by myself, it keeps failing. And so like, I obviously knew that Allison was trying to be in her single season and whatnot, but I also know that we notice when boys are cute. Okay. Like even if you're single, like you still notice. And so I saw that Chris was posting on Instagram, um, about this like preaching tour or something that they were on. And he had this guy in the background with him. And I remember when we watched Princess Diaries 2, Allison being like, oh, I just need a guy with brown hair and blue eyes. Like, you know, which honestly, I don't think that was ever like either of our types that we would go for. It was just like a random thing that we were both like, yeah, Chris Pine, like so cute. And so I see this brown haired, blue eyed guy on Chris's story and I send him to Allison. I'm like, he goes to CLC, like you should date him. And she was like, no, like I'm trying to be single, blah, 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 just different circumstances. But I don't know why I just had a feeling and they end up being like super good friends. The first week she's like, oh yeah, me and Isaiah were friends, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, I guarantee he likes you. She's like, no, he doesn't. I'm like, okay. Then come to find out he likes her and all these different stories. She would tell me like, yeah, this is happening. And I'm like, I bet this. And she's like, no. And I'm like, dude, yes. Like just looking from the outside in and knowing Allison, I just knew how things were going to go down. So 
I'm just never wrong when it comes to these things, but I just know my friends. And there was even a time where she was like, I don't know about this guy. And I'm like, dude, no, we're not doing this again. Like, he's a great guy. We got to like, don't be stubborn. Like I said, it takes us both like a million slaps in the face to finally understand something. But there were just too many signs and coincidences that I was like, we're not missing this blessing. Like we we're, we're doing this. Another thing that uh, I I think is really cool that I don't know if you left it out on purpose or if you just forgot, but something that I thought was really cool was Isaiah's mom's testimony was very similar to Allison's and different people that that Isaiah had grown up with also had very similar testimonies to Allison. And so it didn't shock him at all to hear her story like it didn't turn him away from her at all if anything like all the things that he had gone through allowed him to have a different kind of like empathy and understanding for her that a different man wouldn't have had you know because when you've never gone through anything and you don't understand certain aspects of of people's lives like you you really won't be able to understand someone's story if they've gone through a lot of things and you can try your best to empathize but I think in friendships and relationships it's really cool when you find someone who just genuinely understands you and doesn't make you feel crazy or doesn't make you feel like they don't get you at all so like in our friendship like obviously we we have we were different people we've done different things taken different paths but at the end of the day like we always say like we're each other's like soulmate friend and we're each other's person and like that's something that I've always like held so special to me that like genuinely when when people are kind of venting to me about I just want a close friend like I, I just want my Allison like the amount of people that have said that to me I'm just like, it just speaks for itself. Like when you have a friend like that, people notice that. And so like seeing your best friend go through like one of the hardest times of their lives, like I think sometimes when, you know, when you're in church and and your friend starts to maybe believe things differently than you and take a different path, it can be easy to be like, it's going to be super hard for me to be close with someone when they don't believe the same thing as me. So I'm going to kind of step back a little bit and let them do their thing. Like, I think it's easier to take that path, but I just, I, I just could not imagine my life without her and without being close to her. So I just resolved, like, I'm not going to argue with her. I'm not going to try to like prove her wrong or prove her right or whatever. I'm just going to stick by her side and, and, you know, try to like be there for her, even though I don't necessarily understand everything she's going through. And we always say that like, we were close before all of this, but since this happened, like we're probably the closest we've ever been and only getting closer as time goes by because obviously life isn't perfect. And I've gone through a lot of things myself and like my, the biggest support system that I've had has really come from having a best friend that understands and is able to listen. And that probably also comes from her psychology background is that she's a very good listener and and gives good advice. It was hard to like see her in that way and to see her be just at a, at a low point and not really be able to do anything about it. And so like the amount of 2 a.m. sleepovers that we would have at that time and the amount of like just hour long conversations that we would have and just deep conversations talking about things that we'd never really shared with each other before, like the closeness that was created in that time is just like so special to me. It was hard to not really know like what to do because I just wanted to make everything okay but I, I knew there was really nothing I could say to fix it. And there was nothing I could do. And there was this one time particularly where things were just getting bad and we were having a conversation and I just knew she didn't really believe what I believed anymore. 
And I was just like, I'm not going to argue with you. You can, you can believe what you want. I'm still going to be your best friend. You're not going to push me away. So don't try that. Cause I knew that's what was, was going on. And I'm like, don't try to push me away because I'm going to stay here. And we got off the phone and I called her twin sister and I'm like, Angel, like we got to do something about this girl because this is not going well. She's, I feel like she's trying to push us away. And Angel's like, I think so too. Like we got to do something. So I'm like, all right, let's, I think it was maybe the next day or the day after I'm like, let's fast. Let's all fast. And I called my mom and my sister and my sister-in-law who was just my brother's girlfriend at the time. I don't even think they'd been together for very long. Um, I think also my brother and my dad, if I'm not mistaken, like my whole family was doing it and, and her sister and literally my boyfriend at the time, which is so funny, but I literally called him and I'm like, you got to fast with us tomorrow. And he's like, what? Um, but like, I just had to get this like chain of people and we didn't tell her obviously. Um, but we were just like, we, we have to do something about this. Like we, I, you can't just watch your friends like make these like hard decisions and not want to intervene. So we fasted and we prayed and we were very specific with praying that God would like wake her up or, or show her that he has a plan for all of this or help to heal her heart or whatever the case may be. And it was like several days later that I get a call and she's like, Hey, so I think I'm going to go to CLC. And I was literally like, what? (laughs) It was so out of left field because the conversation that sparked me calling Angel was like basically us disagreeing about apostolic beliefs and and her being like, nope, you're wrong. And me being like, okay, I'm not going to argue with you. And we were just going back and forth. And I'm like, dude, like, how, how did this happen? It's been like a week and now it's like a complete change. So that was actually crazy, but it really showed me the power of fasting and especially also the power of community because where two or three are gathered, like there was just a few of us, but like the community of everyone coming together and believing that this, we're going to, we're going to overcome this as a unit. Like It was just really cool to see that. And and it was really cool to see the people that showed up for her. And I I don't know, it just really meant a lot to me that, that everybody would do that with me because it was, it was a very hard thing to go through and and to see all of that happen. And um, it was just crazy how quick God like turned the situation around. So if I ever had any doubt, in fasting or prayer before I definitely don't now because you, if you want God to turn a situation around fast about it and I'm telling you, he will turn it around so quick. It's actually crazy. So we kind of talked about that term of like an apostolic hater um, and kind of like what that means a little bit. And I feel like everybody knows somebody like that, whether it's somebody who just really doesn't understand or maybe somebody who grew up the same way that you did and decided to take a different route. And now they're like, everything you believe is wrong. And I'm going to convince you why. And, you know, they kind of make you feel weird for believing what you believe. And I feel like sometimes if we, if we allow ourselves to like have those people in our lives and almost have a place in our ear where they're able to like talk to us they can really get into your mind and make you question what you believe when you never really did before. Um, But I think also that sheds light on the fact that maybe your foundation isn't necessarily as strong as you thought. Maybe you were only doing this because you were raised to do it this way and you don't actually have any understanding about why. I think in this instance, that that was probably the case, would you say? Yeah, in a way I I had to relearn everything like, I had to see it for myself. This is a topic I can literally talk about for hours. I'm like so passionate about this. And I think there's like a lot of, it's like multifaceted. There's a lot of like different routes that we can take, but in relation to like modesty and hair and, and like outward standards, 
I think that sometimes there's a disconnect with young people because youth pastors or pastors or, or, you know, children's pastors, they sometimes feel like they don't want to overstep their bounds in like a parent territory. And parents feel like, well, I don't feel like I need to teach them about this because they're learning about it at church. And that's obviously not everyone, but I've talked to a lot of young people about this specifically. And they say like their main reasoning that they don't really understand standards is because nobody sat down and explained it to them. They just have been doing it since they were a little kid. So they just keep doing it and they see that everybody else is doing it. So they're like, I'll just do it too. But it it hasn't really been thoroughly explained. So when maybe somebody else who doesn't have that understanding is asking you, hey, why do you do these things? You don't really have a good reason because you're like, well, my parents do this, my church does it. And from the outside looking in, that's not a good enough reason. Somebody coming into the church who has no understanding of that, that's not going to convince them that this is the truth. Just, oh, well, this is just tradition. Because in, in a lot of other religions, that is the main reason why certain things are followed. It's just because it's tradition. They don't really have any rhyme or reason. But the cool thing about our faith is that everything that we do is completely backed by the Bible. It's all Bible based. We're not going off of like this tradition or this extra doctrine that was written by a prophet or whatever. It's like we believe the whole Bible, the Old and the New Testament. And so during that time, um, when we were kind of going through all of this, um, Allison was able to figure those things out for herself. And not only that, but like explain them to other people and have it make sense for them. So I thought it would be really important to talk about that because I'm sure that some of you guys are struggling with that. And if you are, that's completely normal because a lot of times it is more of a taboo subject and you need to know why you believe what you believe. So I think it's really important to talk about this. Yeah, I think a lot of times when you're raised in the church specifically, we can get really comfortable with just focusing on like, oh, you wear skirts and dresses for modesty and that's that's what you're taught. And that can get very confusing the older you get because you start to realize like, wait, but that's not enough because I've seen people in skirts and dresses who aren't aren't modest at all. So, and you can be way more modest in certain pants and stuff like that so I think that like I got to a point where I was just like nope and I started like going against everything like I could tell you what everyone's gonna say to go against everything um so I had to really like look at it in a different perspective and I had to really look at it in the perspective of someone in the world that has never been taught anything like how do I explain it to them and how do I understand it from that perspective like I needed to be convinced as if I had never been raised in church at all and so I'm super annoying like that like I have to like see things from like an outer perspective rather than like I always say like have an apostolic bias opinion like I don't want to hear it from like some random person in the apostolic world being like oh just be modest like Yes, that's huge. We need to be modest. Don't twist this and think I'm not for modesty. Of course I am. However, that's not good enough to just explain why we wear skirts. And um, so I studied it. And obviously there's the scripture that's talking about not wearing what pertains to men. And people can twist that like, yeah, don't wear men's clothes. Like there's women pants too, blah, blah, blah. However, um, I had to really like study this and to understand it for myself. And one thing I realized is less than a hundred years ago is when it became normal for women to wear pants. And so for thousands and thousands of years, it was the norm for women to dress in dresses. And in fact, and this is what you'll find on the internet and Google, like this isn't coming from any apostolic person. So there's no apostolic bias in this. The internet will literally tell you like it wasn't until like um, the 1900s, I don't remember exactly what year, that women started to wear pants. And in fact, like the first women to wear pants, she was doing it 
out of rebellion. And also it said that <laughs> the internet literally says they considered it to be like manly. And so when I was doing this, I was like, wow, this is like crazy. Like that is, I got to see it from a different perspective of like, just hearing about it in church, because this, what I was studying had nothing to do with church, nothing to do with religion. Um, none of that, like this was just basic history. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw like for thousands of years, like women wore dresses and it wasn't up until like basically this generation in the, in the, um, one above us that like even grew up normalizing women wearing things that pertain to men. And, um, one thing I had to realize is like, yeah, now the culture is like completely different. So we seem like the odd ones out, like, Oh, you're like, you're dressing like you're in from the olden days by wearing those modest dresses. And it's like, but this was the norm for thousands of years. And while the culture changes, scripture stays the same. And so mm -hmm. even though like everybody in the world is doing something completely different for thousands of years, they did the same thing. So now we look like crazy for wearing skirts, but it really like they would have been the odd ones out if they were born two generations ago because this was the norm for thousands of years. Like I said, yeah, cultures do change, but the scripture stays the same. So none of that is changing. And so this was like the realization I had to have to have like that greater understanding of like the importance of that. So personally for me, that's, that's what I needed to have that revelation for myself. And then um, when it comes to hair it was the same thing like I didn't I always grew up knowing the scripture that says but if a woman have long hair it's her glory and given to her for a covering and I, I had been told like long hair means uncut um but I never really looked into it for myself and so it wasn't until there was this guy who talked to like three different um college professors who are like their profession was in Hebrew and Greek language. So he emailed these professors of Greek and Hebrew, three different professors, and was like, what does this scripture mean? Like, what's the interpretation of the scripture? And he sent the, but if a woman have long hair, it's her glory. And, and given to her for a covering. And all of the professors responded that long hair meant uncut, untouched hair. And after seeing that, I was like, oh my gosh, because again, this has no apostolic bias because it's literally coming from college professors of Greek and Hebrew, like literally study this language. And so like me, me seeing that like opened my eyes to the reality of that. And I was like, whoa, like that's crazy. Like now I understand it much better than like previously. So Anyways, I feel like a lot of times when people are coming into the church, they need to have this explained a certain type of way. You can't just say like, oh, long hair means this or like, I mean, you could and some people listen. But a lot of times if you listen right away and just catch on to it, like you're just doing it because everyone else said it and you didn't actually learn it for yourself, which is why eventually that'll go away. And you're going to be like, wait, I don't believe this and like run away. But the people right. who take time to learn it and like it's a process and it takes time. They're the ones that are going to stay long-term because they studied it out for themselves and got an understanding on their own. Yeah. So that's where, that's where I was at um, with the whole modesty thing and understanding why we do what we do and why we dress the way that we do and like why we uphold a certain standard, the way that we do and stuff like that. Yeah. And I like that you use the word process too, because I feel like, we have a tendency to when someone comes to the church, like to kind of project a timeline onto them of like, okay, so after the first month, like you should start doing this and you should, you know, take out your earrings and start wearing this. And, and it's like, that is not realistic to how people actually work. And like Allison was saying, there are people who will catch on right away and sometimes it sticks, but other times it's like after a little while, they realize like, wait a minute, I don't actually believe this. I was just doing it to fit in. And I know so many people like that, that end up either leaving the church or going to a different faith 
because it aligns more with the way that they want to look or the things they want to do or whatever. And so rather than like projecting a timeline and saying like, Hey, I think by month two, this person should be doing this. You really need to actually take the time to teach people why you believe what you believe just doctrinally. And then we can start introducing like standards. This is why we look the way we look. This is why we don't do this, whatever. But people need to learn just basically the plan of salvation first. That's the first thing. We should never try to project a style of dress onto someone immediately. And I just feel like anyone who does that, you're doing this new convert such a disservice because you're basically saying like, hey, all we care about is rules. And that's just not the reality of of what what we believe or what we should believe. And I believe it was, you talked about a video that Bishop Bernard um, did on YouTube where he actually talked about this. And so we could probably link that down below. Um, But we talk about this word legalism, which a lot of people, they really shy away from that word or they don't like it. But basically like, we just don't want to have like a legalistic mindset of like, we're just going to push rules onto you. Like, I think it should be relationship over rules. And even in like a friendship or a relationship, like you don't just instantly start doing things that you've never done before. The second you get into a relationship or a friendship, like there's a process to those things. So obviously this is a little different, but when you start dating someone, you don't instantly just tell them your whole life story you have to build up a trust for them, right? You don't just instantly start, you know, going places with them and and trusting everything about them. Like you have to kind of build a relationship and those things will come with time. And so it's obviously a little bit of a different analogy, but when it comes to like starting a relationship with God, I think that focusing on the inward first and making sure that you're repentant you're baptized in the name of Jesus, you know, you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're trying to live an overcoming life with, with the Holy Spirit, you are now trying to walk with the Spirit and have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And with each of those things, you'll start to understand more like why you want to do these things and why you want to dress differently, look differently. And more than anything, I really feel like it just comes down to sacrifice and submission and not this oh it's a rule so I'm doing it do you know what I mean yeah it's kind of similar to like in a relationship with somebody when you love them you're not focusing on like oh I love them but I just I have to be loyal to them I have to kiss them occasionally I have to be nice to them like you don't list off all these things that you do it correctly in a relationship that just comes because you love them. So Mm -hmm. it's like your relationship with God. Like if you have that relationship with God and you love him, like all of the rest just falls into play. Like, it's not about like, Oh, but if I'm like, if I love God, then I have to do all this stuff. Like, it's not the focus of what to do. That just comes naturally when you have that relationship with him. And so, yeah, it's a process for everybody and everybody has a different timing of it. And we have to like, have grace for everybody and never push anything onto them because the Bible does talk about like God looks at the inner, not the outer, like the men look at the outer. However, like if the inner is what is correct, like that's going to show out on the outer as well. And that's relationships. Like you don't have to prove you love somebody if all your actions show it. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you say like, Oh, I love you, but you, you do everything like to hurt them and everything they go against everything in a relationship um then that's not showing that you love them if you truly right. love them you this that and the other um because you have that relationship with them and it's the same with your relationship with god like faith without works is dead but that doesn't mean we're saved by our works like no that's not what it means so it's just like it just comes all together like it's a full circle it's not one or the other yeah i completely agree i think when you start with the inward, it will all come full circle and the outward will display what's on the inside. And 
obviously like if you understand things and you choose not to do them, then like, sure, that's rebellion. But like, if you genuinely have no understanding, you've never had someone interpret those scriptures that way, because a lot of faiths do interpret those scriptures in completely different ways. And so if you don't understand that, or if you've never been in church a day in your life and had anyone explain it to you, you've never even read the Bible yourself. I just think it's, it's doing new converts or just someone who's struggling such a disservice to just force something on them without thoroughly helping to explain. And so if you're in that place of like, I don't really understand why I believe this, I'm kind of just doing it. I would really encourage you to talk to someone that's a leader in your life that you can trust. And even if that's not a parent or a sibling, but it's maybe like a youth pastor or your pastor's wife or an older mentor in your church, like I really encourage you to reach out and have those conversations because a lot of times if you let those things fester and you you know that you don't really believe something, eventually you will just leave because once you get old enough and nobody's forcing you anymore, it's like, what's keeping you in? Because you don't really get it. You don't really want it. So if you are struggling and you don't really understand, I would definitely encourage you to reach out to someone that you trust, or you can talk to either of us. You can DM us, whatever. And she can probably go into even more detail about what she learned because I mean, just seeing seeing the change like firsthand and seeing how she went from being like, nope, it's not, I don't agree to being like, actually, let me tell you the Greek and the Hebrew. I was like, okay, what's going on? And that was really cool to see. So like I said, if you, if you want to talk to somebody about that, and maybe there's not someone that you trust, um, you can always reach out to us, of course. So yeah, we kind of, you know, relayed that relationship with God back to relationships with people in a sense, um, which I feel like is a perfect way to kind of get into, we wanted to talk about dating in this generation and just how it is, it's unprecedented compared to like past generations and just how we handle things so differently when my mom talks about her experiences with dating, it is so different than how ours is. It was very common for like a guy at church or at a youth event to ask you on a date and you go on a date that weekend and then maybe it doesn't work out. So you go on a date with a different guy the next weekend. And that was normal. But now it's kind of the stigma of like, if you go on a lot of dates, people are like, what are you doing? Like that girl's dating everybody. And it's like, our culture as far as dating has changed so much in the way that we view things. And I think most people can agree that the culprit behind that is social media and how accessible everything is because it used to be a guy is interested in you. He comes up to you, he gets the number for your landline and then he calls your house phone and plans a date with you. Now it's like, he likes your story. And then you're kind of like, okay, should I like his back? So you like his back. Then he likes your post. So you like his post. Then he responds to your story. And it's like this back and forth game of like, does he like me? Does he not? And I just think that's so crazy that we have gotten to that point of like, everything really is like a game. And I feel for everybody that's a part of this because your girl is in the trenches with all of you. So um, I completely get it. But going through all of this, I've just really like made it a point. I'm not playing these games with these boys anymore. Like a real man is going to pursue you. He's going to court you. He's going to make his intentions known. And so until somebody does that, I'll just be here because... I just feel like if you allow yourself to play these games and accept that, that's what you're going to think that's all that you deserve. That's what you're going to basically train your mind to think that that's what you deserve and that's the best that you can get. And I just don't think that that's true. I think that you deserve a man that is going 
to pursue you that is not going to play games. And not only that, but someone that isn't looking for the next best thing. Because I think that social media has also made that a huge like thought in people's minds is like, well, I don't want to settle down because what if I find someone better? Or, you know, what if I find someone better looking? I think that's like, that's a big thing right now is, is everybody feels like there could be something better. So they don't want to settle down just yet. And uh, I don't know. I, I think social media is good in some ways. And there's definitely like some cool things that have come out of it. But it's also really messed up the way that we look at relationships and the way that we go about them. I'm worried. Oh, yeah, I saw this like post and it was like so true. Like the reason that so many people struggle in their relationships, whether it be marriage or just dating relationships, um, it's so quick. Like when you're having a hard time with them, you can so quickly get on social media and get like a false gratification from like anybody with a click of a button. So I feel like that has like affected this generation so much, which is why like there's just insanely high divorce rates and insanely high amount of affairs like going on. It's because it's anyone is available with a click of a button, one phone call away, one text away. Like they're just so like accessible at your fingertips that it's really done damage to like dating and marriage in this generation, which is super sad. Um, but there definitely are still people out there that are mature enough to like want to pursue somebody and like want a serious relationship. But unfortunately, like huge majority of people are like not it anymore. <laughs> and the amount of like Christian women that I know that have resorted to dating apps is honestly so discouraging. And, and they all just say the same thing. Like it's so hard to find a good guy, even in church. Like it's so hard. And, you know, I, I know plenty of women that have married amazing guys, so they definitely are out there, but I think there's a couple things that play into it. Like number one, like not to like, you know, steal your terminology from earlier, but sometimes we try to play God and we try to like rush our timeline and do things the way that we want to. And then of course it doesn't work out because that person wasn't for us. We probably weren't even supposed to talk to that person but we wanted to. So we rushed it and we tried to make it a thing and it didn't work out. Or people are so used to having everything so accessible and everything at their fingertips that they don't really know how to like see like the greatness that's in front of them or what could be this amazing thing that's right before their eyes because they're so used to seeing like all of these things come across their screen and they're almost just like waiting for the next thing that's going to give them like a dopamine hit or whatever. Like, and so I think it's really important to like, just kind of like monitor what you're paying attention to, what you're allowing to get into your brain. If that's like using dating apps or watching dating shows or having social media with like, all of these influencers that don't look like apostolic young women on your page. If you're following like all of these influencers that wear immodest clothing or they conduct themselves a certain way, like, of course, that's what you're going to be chasing. You're going to be chasing someone who's showing their skin or someone who's acting more promiscuous. And so you're not going to want someone that's trying to save themselves for marriage. And you're not going to want someone that's covering themselves up because you've conditioned your mind to look for something that's going to entice you. And so whether you're a man or a woman who's watching this, I would just like really encourage you to try to be mindful of whatever the media it is that you're consuming or things that you're looking at online, whatever that may be, and try to limit that and so that it lines up with, with what you should be looking for as a Christian. If you're looking for someone that's going to emulate your favorite actor, your favorite reality star, your favorite influencer, like you're just not going to find that in the church. And so if that's kind of like what's influencing you to want someone like that, 
limit that media, unfollow that person, try to be more discerning and understand that like, if you really want a Proverbs 31 woman, like write down those characteristics and try to match them up to the person that you're talking to. I heard this thing that it's like, men, if you want a Proverbs 31 woman, woman, you have to be a Proverbs 1 through 30 man. Hmm. Like you have to line up to all of Proverbs to deserve like a Proverbs 31 woman. Yeah, that's so good. And that kind of segues into like another thing we were going to mention is that, you know, we were both kind of in a season of singleness, um, our single eras. And uh, in 2020 and 2021, where we were kind of navigating like our lives after these tough situations, um, we'd both just kind of gone through a lot, like through the ringer with guys like disappointing us and, and just not being like what we needed. And so we were kind of like, you know what, let's just like not date anyone right now and work on ourselves and just have this single era and whatever. So we went to a coffee shop and we made future husband lists, which I have mine right here. And we also, not just that, but we also made um, these lists that this mine is, uh, called things I need to work on before I can be a good wife. Um, so we kind of made like husband lists and then lists for ourselves. And we tried to be like pretty realistic. Um, you know, we, I remember we had watched like princess diaries too. And of course, like the male protagonist is brunette with blue eyes. And we were just like, Oh my gosh, she's so cute. Like, need me a Chris Pine look like, but we did not write that down. We were just like only like qualities that pertain to personality or spirituality. Like we weren't trying to write down like, okay, he needs to be really tall. He needs to have blue eyes, big eyebrows, like full head of hair. Obviously try to find you a man who does not have a receding hairline, but if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, you know? But anyways, So we tried to be realistic with what was on the list. And um, I'm I'm not going to go through every single thing because it is kind of long. But just a few things that I really wanted were like someone who obviously has a good relationship with the Lord, someone who has their priorities in check, someone who's ministry minded and, and desires for that, puts God at the center of their life, a spiritual leader, because I've been in in situations before where I've been the one that's stronger, whether that's spiritually or mentally or whatever. And as a woman, it is not your job to carry that load. Like the Bible literally talks about a headship. It should be God, man, woman. So when you're trying to be the man, it brings out the masculine side of you. You aren't able to be sweet and soft and pure because you're so focused on like being, you know, the leader and trying to help them and trying to help yourself. And we can talk about that forever. Cause like, you know, I have a lot to say, but I, I've realized that there were certain situations where, because I felt like I had to carry them, I wasn't able to fully rest in like my femininity. And I, I had to be more masculine and I just did not like that. So, you know, I, I kind of just go down different traits, like good listener, humble, patient, loves and prefers others, like respectful, affectionate, assuring, that kind of thing. Um, not insecure, isn't cruel or unkind. And these are just like, I feel like traits of a Christian. So I don't feel like it's too much to ask. But basically what we resolved was we're going to pray over these lists and pray for our future husbands and and really make our desires known to God because the Bible talks about how God will give you the desires of your heart if you make your requests known. And so we wanted to be really intentional and be like, God, this is what I'm seeking. And not only that, but here's some things I want to bring to the table. So for the things that I needed to work on, some things that I wrote down were being more prayerful and more intentional in my walk with God, 
not oversharing because I'm a huge oversharer, being more serious, having a better routine, being more slow to anger and slower to speak, complaining and criticizing less, you know, being closer with my family. And honestly, like this, this list was made like two and a half years ago. And as I'm kind of going through it, I know that by praying about these things that God has like worked on me a lot. And I obviously still have a long way to go. And I think you should never feel like I've made it because once you feel like you've made it, you lost it. That's what my dad always says. Um, but I, I'm so thankful that I, I feel like God has really worked on me in a lot of these ways and he's still working on me. But I think being honest with yourself and being honest with God and not trying to like trick yourself into thinking that you don't have anything you can work on. It's really important. And I think it, it shows God that you're ready to be real with him and you want to work on those things and you need his help. So I would definitely encourage you to make a list of not only qualities that you're looking for in a spouse, but qualities that you know that you need God's help with to be a better person, to be a better Christian and ultimately a better partner for your future spouse. Um, and you don't have to share that with anyone. Obviously I'm sharing it with you guys because we're talking about it, but like, you know, you don't have to share that with anyone. You can just have that be a conversation between you and God and watch how God uses those things that you wanted and gives you desires of your heart because you were being real with him and you were being like so intentional about saying exactly what you were seeking. Obviously, like in my case with the future husband list, like Isaiah, not only off every box on the list, but it's like God gave me even more than I knew that I wanted. Like he gave me certain things about Isaiah and his family that like is a huge blessing that I didn't even know that I'd want in a future husband but like it's made it so much better. So like he genuinely gives you that and more. Um, and so it's just like amazing to see it come full circle. And it's super important to have those boundaries set of like, I'm not settling for less than this because the most important decision you're ever going to make is who you're going to marry. You're going to spend the rest of your life with them. You need to not only think about, are they going to be a good spouse to me, but are they going to be a good father to my kids? Mm -hmm. Because you saw this thing that said you can choose who you get um who you end up with but your children don't get to choose their father so wow. like let's make sure it's a good decision because you get to choose them but they don't and so that's a huge huge decision and i think so many people just end up settling um for honestly anything like horrible situations because they think that like that's just it and that's just their person but it's like trust me don't believe that lie <laughs> like that is a lie from the devil like there is someone else out there for you that is going to benefit you in so many ways and like it's just obviously I could talk about this all day but um it's super important that you make the right decision when it comes to marrying somebody I think it can be really hard like when you go through a breakup with someone that you really thought like this was going to be my person. Like it, you can feel like there's no one else in the world and you're never going to get over this. But once you're on the other side and you can think clearly and your, your thoughts are not clouded by like emotions, you understand like, wow, there was a lot of things that I was settling on. There were a lot of things that I wanted that I just wasn't getting. And now I know that going forward, I, I want more and I deserve more because I know that I'm putting in all of this and I want that person to put in just as much as me, you know, like I don't want this to be a one-sided thing, but you know, it can be hard to see that in the moment, but I think we can both attest to sometimes you think you want something and once you don't have it anymore, you realize like, wow, I was sacrificing a lot and I was accepting a lot of things that I should not have been accepting. And you realize like, okay, 
this, this was for the best and God will bring you somebody who's way better for you. Yeah. And I will end it with saying like, it's literally so important that you stop trying to do it on your own. Stop searching for this perfect man. Like just stop. Literally, you just have to be like, okay, I'm done playing God and I give it all to you. And I want, I just want nothing to do with like having control. And it wasn't until the moment I literally surrendered my life and everything I had known for years since I was 14 years old. I said, here you go, God, whatever, do what you want with it. And like, yeah, everything fell apart, but everything built back up way beyond anything I had and anything I could have ever fathomed. So it's, that's not going to happen until you just literally give it all to God. And um, one thing that people say is like, you don't let your boyfriend keep you from your husband. And it's true. So people, like hold on to like little relationships here and there. Like, oh, maybe I'm not going to be with him, but I'm just going to hold on to him until I personally didn't do this. But I'm just saying some people are like, I'm just going to hold on to this person until like a better one comes along and that'll be my husband. And it's like, no, you have to give it all up. Give up guys in general, focus on you and your walk with God. If you're so focused on like getting a guy, like you no, that's, it's not going to work like that. You have to like surrender it all to God and like genuinely, like he knows your heart. And so when you're like, I give it all to you, like I'm done doing this on my own, like then it allows him to come in and be God <laughs> because you're no longer trying to play him. And so, um, thing I want to put so much emphasis on like it's nothing that I did it's not any luck for me it's that I finally got to a moment of being vulnerable with God and just being like this is miserable and I cannot do it on my own anymore and I'm sorry for trying to do it on my own for so long like please help me like I, I surrender it all to you and that in that moment is when I allowed God to finally come in and like start to lead me and then things just started to fall into place and that's why I'm here now is because of that and also like I think it's important too to like to try our best to see God as he is I feel like it's so it's so easy to look at God as like this big bad who is just putting obstacles in our way to like teach us a lesson and to show us that we're wrong and you hear these things and there's obviously biblical truth behind them, but people will talk about he's vengeful God. He's a jealous God. And it's like, that's true, but he's also a loving God. So don't trick yourself into thinking that God is trying to hurt you or God is trying to keep something from you to teach you a lesson and to make you do this or that. Like maybe right now you just have a lot of things that you need to work on and your future husband is also working on those things. And that's okay. And you guys will meet when the time is right. But don't look at God as though he is trying to keep something from you. Maybe he is just trying to mold you and make you into what you need to be. And he sees the desires of your heart and he loves you. He's going to give you those things in due time. But don't look at him as though he's trying to punish you because that's not what it is. Yeah. And I think that so many people put so much blame on God that has nothing to do with God necessarily. For example, he gives us free will. So there's so many things in life that we settle for that God never intended us to settle for. Therefore, the hurt that we're feeling is a hurt God never intended us to feel. Mm -hmm. That's something I realized because it was such a deep hurt that I literally worse than anything I've ever been through. And I had to realize this is a hurt that God never intended me to feel ever. It's our own fault because we're human, but like we were so quick to blame God and like God's looking like, I gave you free will. Like if you would have went to me in prayer first, I would have never, you know, so it's kind of like, it's, it's not God's fault. However, he can turn what the enemy meant for evil. He can turn to good. So he mm -hmm. can use those situations that maybe you weren't, and you weren't supposed to go through necessarily like it could have been avoided, but now he's going to use those situations for good. Yeah. I think it's, it's very important to remember that like a lot of times when we try to force a situation, we do end up hurting ourselves. And like 
that is something that we can both attest to like a million times over is like, you can keep trying with that person and keep trying to make it work and keep trying to fit a puzzle piece where it does not belong. But eventually you're just going to hurt yourself because it does not work. And I personally have had to learn this the super hard way that sometimes you go through stuff because you made a dumb decision and you didn't actually trust that God was going to answer that prayer. And so if you're kind of in that, you know, season right now where you're struggling with like, why isn't God giving me my spouse? Like I'm trying to do everything. I'm, I'm trying to go to events. I'm trying to connect with people. It's like, maybe just don't try to do that. Maybe just try to like take a break, work on yourself, just enjoy your single era as we call it and work on yourself. A lot of people have told me that it's in that season when God brings your spouse to you because you're like the best version of yourself at that time. And so I don't know what's going on with me, but you know, (laughs) um, but no, I'm just kidding. Definitely wanted to talk about that because I know that that is something that a lot of us are struggling with and trying to understand like what's going on, you know, like why isn't my future husband like banging on my door and like begging me, like, where is he? Is he ever coming? So I think it's encouraging to know that other people are going through that. And, um, and other people have been through that right before they met their person or whatever. The last thing that we wanted to kind of talk about in, in regards to relationships is friendship. I think that more than even relationships, sometimes it is so important to have good friends in your life and not just good friends, but godly friends and friends of like a like mind and of a like-minded faith. And so, you know, as we said earlier in this video, we've been friends for 15 years. How do you cultivate a friendship that lasts that long, that literally has lasted over a decade, that has lasted through like every horrible season of life and every good season of life. And like, how do you do that? You know, you don't, it it is rare that you hear that, that people have been friends for that long. When you do, there's a reason that people are like, wow, you guys have been friends for that long? Because it's hard to believe in this generation that somebody would stick by you for such a long time and see you in, in all these different seasons of life and still choose to be close to you. So we kind of wanted to like, just share maybe some things that we've learned um, throughout the years and maybe just some tips on, on how we've stayed close, especially with Allison moving literally across the country and being in a time zone that's three hours before mine and being in a completely different season of life as well. Um, you know, her being married, me being single and living at home. So Yeah, we kind of just wanted to share some of our experiences. I think that one of the most important parts of having like a long lasting friendship is being able to see them where they're at um, in every season. Like we've been through so many different seasons of life together. And obviously, um, Kate mentioned previously, I believe that we've gotten even more close in the last three years than we have all 15 years. So like, obviously, we met on the playground in third grade. Um, so you're only so close because you barely have gone through life, but we loved seeing each other at uh, Crusaders camp and senior camp. And then she, <laughs> she, she me and my twin sister and another friend to all go to the same school as her in high school, like randomly, like weeks prior to, to going there, she just convinced us to come. So then obviously we, we got super close in high school. Honestly, we've gone through certain like times of like not as close but honestly it just takes being able to understand the other person and allowing like open communication and like allowing each other to speak and like it takes a lot of forgiveness and and just like grace that we're both humans and we're both growing and like we're both like trying to handle all this emotion of life and being able to understand each other's different seasons because while we grew up next to each other, basically, especially since high school, 
we still faced very different seasons of life and very different worlds. And so I feel like being able to like understand where the other person is at at all times is like super important in my opinion. Don't you agree? Like understanding that. Yeah. And and how to approach them in in this particular season, because we're constantly changing. Mm -hmm. I'm not the same person I was three years ago. Like we discussed this entire time today. And Kate's not the same person she was three years ago. We're constantly changing. You have to have that mindset of like, you're always going to be changing a little bit. And I think that um, for us, we've kind of like gone through it together in a way. And so we've like grown cl- closer together through through every season. Um, and that would be like my perspective of it. I saw a video the other day where somebody was talking about how the main reason that people use for a marriage failing or a friendship failing is just that we grew apart. You know, we evolved after we got together and we realized we were just two different people and it just didn't work. And I think it's so easy to use that excuse of like, well, we're just two different people. Like, you know, we just changed, but like the cool thing about being in a long-term friendship or a long-term relationship is you get to see each other grow and you get to like be a part of that story. So I can't imagine being like, Oh, Allison's personality is completely different than it was three years ago. So like, I don't want to be friends with her anymore. Like that's just crazy to me to be like, yeah, your personality is different. So it's not going to work. Like I appreciate all the growth that we have both had. And I, I like that we are able to like recognize it and like actually put it into words because we've seen each other at our literal lowest. Like when I tell you we have seen each other in the trenches and, and it's honestly just made us closer. Like I, I don't, I think it's such a cop out to say, you know, we just grew apart. Like, I think that you should be growing together and encouraging each other in that growth. I think another thing is, and what I've noticed in a lot of female friendships is that sometimes resentment starts from a little simple misunderstanding and it grows into like, I've, I've had conversations face to face with other girls where I can literally tell that they do not like their best friend like that. Like they're, they like resent them because the things that they say about them, it's like, it's very clear to me, like, uh uh-oh, you guys have some sort of underlying beef that you're not talking about. And we've been in a seat, we've been in seasons like that before where, where there were things that weren't being said. And there were feelings that both parties had that nobody wanted to address. But once we finally did have hard conversations, it just made us that much stronger because we were able to be comfortable and we were able to establish like a communication between us where now if, and I mean, to be fair, this doesn't happen really, but if there was a situation where she said something I didn't like, or I said something she didn't like, we could just say that we wouldn't have to be like feeling some type of way and and feeling like we can't say it. We've established a closeness to where like we can share if something is bothering us and we know that the other person will fix it and not continue upsetting us or, or making us feel upset about that. I think it's like super important um, when you're communicating with your best friend, like to be able to both be vulnerable about how each other feels and not be dismissive about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, you're still two different people and you're going to, sometimes arguments happen because you have a a misperception of what happened and the other person thinks something totally different happened than the other person does. And if you don't communicate that, then you're never going to solve it. So you have to be able to like communicate, like it felt like this. And then the other person's like, no, I didn't think that at all. Like I thought this. So like, it's kind of like, you just need that open communication without, without being like, belittling and dismissive of somebody else's feelings like you can have an argument um Mm -hmm. and and sometimes and honestly we've probably argued like five times like serious arguments like maybe five times in our entire friendship would you say that's accurate yeah I would say like big like blowout arguments 
like five times. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having little disagreements. I feel like people think that's such a negative thing to disagree with like the person they're dating or with a friend. And they're like, well, we're fighting. It's not a fight. We just don't agree because we're two different people bringing two different experiences and perspectives to the table. And we can talk about something without it being a fight. So don't just label every little thing as a fight because it's not, you can disagree with someone and still be friends with them. Like, I feel like a lot of times in, in conversation or in disagreements, instead of fully absorbing and listening to what the other person is saying, you're thinking about what you want to say next. And you're thinking about your perspective and you're not really actively listening to what the other person is saying, but like, try your best. If you want a healthy, close friendship to not do that and actually listen and try to validate their feelings. Don't just like make them feel like they're crazy for thinking that or they're wrong or, or whatever, like try your best to validate their emotions and, and change what, if it, if there's something that's hurting them that you're doing, try to change that. Don't just use that excuse of, well, that's just the way I am. Cause that's not, that's not really fair. And you wouldn't want someone saying that to you because you're, you know, openly communicating like, Hey, I don't like this. It kind of hurts my feelings when you do this. If someone just comes back at you and says, that's just the way I am. It's like, all right. (laughs) Well, it's like, thanks for that. Like, I don't really know how we can proceed. Um, so I think like in our relationship, like we've tried to learn each other enough to where we're like, okay, what's going on? What can I do to like fix it? And we don't feel like uncomfortable having those conversations. Like, you know, we pretty much talk about everything, like nothing's off the table. And, um, it would be weird to me if something was off the table. I would be like, oh, what happened? What's going on? One thing that we're not is we're not high maintenance friends. We don't demand each other's attention. We don't get aggressive with each other. Like, what? Are, you know, like, so quick to be like, oh, what are you doing today? You haven't responded. Like, if anything, we're, we're just like, bro, are you alive? Like, stuff like that. But, like, <laughs> we, we can understand that goes back to, like, meeting that person where they're at. Because like, we both understand each other's lives. And we know that you're not always going to be available, even though we pretty much make time every single day to talk. But (laughs) there's going to be times where she's with her sister all week, and I'm not going to hear from her much. And I'm not going to make her feel bad for not like, I don't, I don't make it into like, you didn't talk to me all week. Are you kidding me? I was Mm -hmm. alone. Like, no, it's not like that. Because we have a a much deeper relationship than that. Neither one of us are like high maintenance like that because we both have lives and like that comes with maturing, I think. Um, but I think like super high maintenance friends are like, you're not going to have very long friendships. Mm-hmm. Sorry to tell you because you're yeah. being, so you expect your friends to do like so much for you. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like It's literally. very draining. Yeah. It's so draining. Your friendship should never be like, draining like it should benefit you and you should like want to talk to them and like um and I think that that's something that's we've gotten more in time as well just like closeness we're just similar in that aspect of like being pretty low maintenance that doesn't mean like we're gonna be a bad friend to each other like no we're still available um for each other but we're also like understanding that each other has different lives and like we're in different seasons. So we have to work around that because I couldn't imagine just being like, well, you're not working with my schedule. So I'm just not going to be friends with you anymore. Like what? That's not even an option. Like that's not even a thought in, in our minds. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're stuck with me now. It's been too long. I can't make another long-term friend like that. (laughs) But yeah, we do. We try to make time. And luckily right now, we're obviously in different seasons of life in certain ways, but in other ways, like we have a little bit more time. She has a job where she has more time where she's driving so she can talk to me on the phone. I'm a nanny. I have 
several hours of, of the day where I'm free because my nanny kids are asleep or I'm driving or, or whatever the case may be. So we do try to make time to talk on the phone and check in and even just not check in, just talk about nothing. Like I usually text her at any inconvenience that I have, like, Hey, my stomach hurts. And she's like, Oh, like what's going on? And I'm like, I don't know. And then like, I'm like, Oh, this person's annoying me. And she's like, Oh, I'm sorry. Like, it's kind of just, Hey, I'm checking in. Like at this point, we, we can talk about nothing for several hours and, and always have fun. And we have literally unpacked every situation in both of our lives, probably like a dozen times where we're like, okay, so remember in eighth grade when this happened, like let's unpack. And like, I think a lot of girl, female friendships do this where you guys kind of just like talk about a lot of the same stuff, but I, I don't know to us. It's so fun. We love doing that. Like I'm pretty sure the other day we had like a random topic that we had never talked about before. And we're like, Oh my gosh, like <laughs> something we've never discussed. I don't even remember what it was, but yeah, we never talked about it. And we were like, like oh. easy. Never before. <laughs> I know. So yeah, it's, I mean, I feel like it's kind of similar to maybe how you would just update your boyfriend throughout the day. Like, Hey, I'm annoyed. My boss was mean to me, like whatever, like you just kind of update them on, on what's going on. And I feel like in the same way that you learn your partner's like love languages or you learn their personality traits, you need to do that for your close friends because you need to know how to communicate to them and what's going to work and what's not. And I think you also kind of have to like understand that you guys will go through different things and, you know, you can be there for each other through those seasons. So like, just because I didn't really understand like what she was going through several years ago, I still tried to be there in the best way that I knew how. And, you know, recently I've gone through a lot in my personal life and Allison has really been there for me. And she's like really been cool with just like listening to me vent a lot, which is, which can be annoying. I feel like if you don't have like a closeness with someone you can feel like, man, like all they're doing is just venting to me all the time. And, and I like, I don't have a chance to talk. It's like, it's, I think it's important to like, understand that being a close friend to someone means that like, sometimes you just have to be there and like walk with them through a situation and have patience and understand that like, this isn't going to be forever. And, you know, like Jonathan and David in the Bible, like, Jonathan was a good friend to David and he was there for him through all of these different like crazy situations, trying to like emulate your friendship after these biblical friendships and understanding that like you can be there for that person and eventually they're going to be there for you too. Yeah. And I think like going off of what you said, like it's super important to understand like every person is different. So like understanding what that friendship, like our friendship is going to look different than our friendships with other people too, in a way, because it's personal to us. And like, you have to understand like what that person needs. So like, maybe in in this case, like I, I can listen if, if Kate needs to like vent about stuff. Whereas like when I was going through stuff, I may not have vented much talking in the moment, but I would call her at 3 a.m. and be like, either I'm coming over or you're coming over. So which one is it? Cause I need someone to speak with me. Like that was it. And then she would, she would just watch movies with me all night to teach me lessons. So I'm getting, <laughs> but like, there may not have been on my end, like much, much talking and venting because sometimes people deal with hurts differently. So your friend may never talk their way through it, but they might just need you to be there with them through it. So like understanding what each other needs is like, super important because it's going to look different um but just being able to be present and understanding what what they need is like crucial and to being successfully being there for them yeah and you hear that saying of like to like if you want to have friends you need to show yourself friendly like what does that mean it doesn't just mean like hey be friendly and you'll make friends it's like if you want a good friend, be a good friend. If you want a friend who's a good listener, be a good listener. 
if you want an encouraging friend, be an encourager to other people. So like whatever qualities you're looking for or you need in a person, try to be that for other people. And and what you're giving out is going to come back to you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want a really good friend, be a really good friend. We just wanted to share our hearts with you about those things. And obviously there's probably a lot of rambling that was done, but we hope that you guys can kind of see our hearts and our intentions in this video. And we do have plans to make more videos in the future about different topics. We will literally get on the phone and talk for hours on end. So this is basically just like us, including you guys in a normal conversation that we would have every day. Like literally yesterday, we were talking about mental health and relationships. And this is just kind of like a normal thing for us. And we want to invite you guys into that. So we hope that you guys enjoyed it, that you got something out of it. Yeah, thank you um, for letting me come on here and share my heart. It's definitely a privilege to come on here and be a part of this. So thank you. And I hope that something we said can touch somebody that watches this. And if you relate, like we're always here if you want to reach out or anything. So thank you so much for being on. I literally loved this. It just felt like a normal chat. I just recorded this time. And um, I'm just excited for the future. I think it's going to be so fun. Yeah, I really hope you guys loved this video because we loved making it. Thank you guys for watching this video. I hope that you loved it. Sorry that we talk so much. This is how all of our phone calls go. We kind of just go down rabbit holes and just talk until somebody's ears fall off. But we hope that this maybe kind of felt like a little friendship conversation that you guys could be a part of. Definitely leave a comment below if you'd like to see more of Allison in these videos because we do have some plans for different videos in the future that we want to make together. But if there's a specific topic that we covered in this video that you guys would like us to expound on further, we would love to do that. Like I said, the two of us can talk for hours, so we would definitely love to include you guys in those conversations. So comment down below and let us know a topic that maybe we covered in this video or maybe that we didn't cover that you just want us to talk about that you would like to see a video on in the future. And I will definitely make sure that we get that done for you guys. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you're having a great day. And I hope you know how much I love you and I missed you guys. And I can't wait to see some of you at NAYC at the end of this month. I am planning on vlogging. I haven't vlogged in so long. So we'll see how that goes. But I am planning on vlogging. And I'm just excited to get back to YouTube. I've definitely missed you guys. And I've heard you guys. I've heard you in the comments. I've heard you in my DMs. And I've heard you in person. And I'm back. And I just, I want you guys to know that... I really do care about this. I do see it as a form of ministry and I'm just excited to be doing this again and to just be talking about topics that I feel are very important for this generation and just very excited to be doing this again. Can't reiterate that enough. I love you guys so much and can't wait to see you in person. And I hope you have a great day and I will see you in the next video. Bye, guys. Um, should I say something? <laughs> if you want to. I was just going to say, like, um, <laughs> this sounds so weird to, like, call you by name. But, <clears throat> um, yeah, thank you, Kate, for letting me. Um, 